Alzheimer's. My name is Laurel Clark, and I'm the library director. And I'm going to welcome you all here tonight. It's a tight fit, but we're glad to see you. So I would like to just ask you to kindly turn off your cell phones if you do have them on. And I would like to remind you of the emergency exits. We have one here and then one in the door that you came through. So I would like to bring up uh, our library trustee, Tim Murphy. He is largely responsible for helping to organize this event, and he will be introducing our speaker tonight. Tim? Hello, everybody. Can you hear me in the back OK? Uh, the library and the, the trustees decided to organize this series because we know that so many people in our community have questions and concerns about Alzheimer's disease. So we really hope uh, that this series will provide useful information about research, about prevention, and about treatment of Alzheimer's disease. And it's great to see such a, a, a big crowd here for tonight. Uh, at the end of the lecture tonight, um, and Q&A, uh, we ask that you fill out a brief survey in the back uh, to give us your thoughts about the program. Uh, we do have one more coming up. Our speaker tonight is Dr. William Renahan, Associate Director of the Ryan Institute for Neuroscience at the University of Rhode Island. Dr. Renahan is widely recognized for his research on the formation of neural circuits in the developing brain and has recently expanded his work to include the study of interactions between the environment and gene expression. He's currently collaborating with other investigators at URI's Ryan Institute on ways to identify how inflammation can contribute to neurogenerative diseases. Please welcome me, welcome, join me in welcoming Dr. Renahan. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here uh, and uh, speak with you and converse with you a little bit uh, tonight. Uh, this is a dangerous time. I've, as a faculty member for many years, I've always been wary of speaking in the late afternoon towards early evening because uh, no matter what your age, people start to fade a little bit. But we'll, I'm going to uh, talk for about a half hour and uh, we'll have time for questions afterwards. Please feel free to interrupt during uh, the presentation if you have questions, if something isn't making sense. Uh, I'm going to begin with some background information. Uh, there, I'll not spend too much time on the technical stuff, but I'll talk to you enough that if there, it may uh, uh, cause you to think about something that maybe you've been wondering about and you can ask me then or, or later and then talk uh, a, a bit more about what we now understand to be approaches to reducing one's risk of developing Alzheimer's disease. Uh, and uh, this is probably at the present time when uh, there have been so many disappointing uh, results from the clinical trials. This is probably one of the most exciting things. This, uh, as we'll talk uh, about tonight, there are things that you can do uh, at, at any age and at any state of uh, dementia, if you're unlucky enough to have dementia, that, that can uh, make things better. And uh, that's an encouraging piece of news. Uh, like, like many of the people in this room, uh, my uh, family has uh, dealt with this uh, awful disease. Uh, my father and two of his siblings uh, died of Alzheimer's disease, which puts me at a very high risk. So I'm always eager to learn about things that one can do to, to reduce their risk. As Diane will attest, sometimes I'm a bit better at doing those things than others. <laughs> but, uh, but, uh, but I try. So, uh, not to belabor the point, let's begin with a few concepts. So, what is dementia? Anybody like to suggest a definition for dementia. What, what does dementia mean to you? Anybody brave enough to? <laughs> it's always tough at the beginning. You have to kind of work your courage up. Yes. I say memory loss. Okay, memory loss. What, what, what else does it mean to you? Yes. Cognitive ability. Cognitive ability, maybe loss of cognitive ability. There are a number of de definitions for dementia. Uh, and I'm going to present one 
that kind of captures the general uh, concept as most frequently used. It's not a disease in and of itself. It's actually a syndrome. It's a group of symptoms characterized by difficulties with memory, language, <laughs> problem solving, and other cognitive skills that, and this is the important part, affects a person's ability to perform everyday activities. So we all have moments during uh, our daily lives where we <coughs> say to ourselves, oh, jeez, I can't remember where I put those keys, or mm -hmm. where did I park my car, or um, <coughs> what was it that I was meant to do? And <coughs> for, for those of us that uh, don't have dementia, you can usually wait a minute or two and it'll come to you, or sometimes you can use a little memory jog. See, I wasn't in there, I was thinking about that. Oh, yeah, right, right. It's, the, it's when it starts to happen very frequently, so frequently, that it affects your ability to actually conduct your life as you have conducted it for, for decades. Uh, very frequently, it's first uh, experienced uh, by other people as you start to maybe uh, have difficulty with your checkbook and, and people notice that you're having difficulty, it's taken you kind of a long time. Maybe you yourself notice that uh, you're having trouble balancing the checkbook or uh, you get notices in the mail saying, you know, you, you haven't paid your, your gas bill now for three months and then the family starts to get involved saying, mom or dad, you know, why is it that you're having trouble and these things often begin to tip the scales and say that okay there's this little memory issue that I've had is now becoming problematic enough that um, I'm starting to be concerned and other people are being concerned because I'm, I'm not functioning as well and it's impacting my ability to actually go seamlessly and smoothly through life What is Alzheimer's disease? So, Alzheimer's disease is a disease, and it in fact is the most common form of dementia. It accounts for 60 to 80 percent of the cases of dementia. There are many ways to categorize the severity of Alzheimer's disease. I'm going to use one that just groups Alzheimer's disease into mild, moderate, and severe. And according to this scheme, in mild <laughs> Alzheimer's disease, you're still independent. Right? You can still function very well on your own. But you're starting to need help with some activities. Maybe, as I mentioned, that the checkbook is becoming a problem. Uh, you're not paying the bills. You need someone, maybe a friend or family member, to, to remind you, okay, this is the first of the month, remember, you've got to bring the check to the bank. Or these things that normally wouldn't have been a problem for you, or now you, you need someone to help you along. <clears throat> Moderate Alzheimer's disease is when you're starting to encounter more difficulty performing these routine tasks, you find that you're becoming easily confused. And perhaps one of the most uh, stereotypic characteristics of people at this stage of the progression of the disease is that people start to wander, and that becomes a bigger and bigger issue for people with Alzheimer's disease. At first, uh, you, you might just start wandering around and kind of forget where you're, why, why was I walking down the street this way? As the disease progresses, it becomes a bit more problematic. You may forget how to get back home. And wandering, in fact, then from this point on becomes a challenge for people with, with the disease because uh, of a safety concern. With severe Alzheimer's disease, uh, even the most daily activities of, of uh, the basic activities of daily living uh, are, are difficult and, and the individual requires assistance. Uh, at this point, the individual often loses the ability to communicate, one of the most difficult things for family members and friends to deal with. And as different parts of the brain become affected, one of the things that uh, is uh, seen uh, as the disease becomes quite severe is that it becomes a difficulty swallowing. 
And in fact, this is one of the contributors to uh, the death. The, Alzheimer's disease is a terminal illness. And one of the, the leading factors that contributes to, to death for people who have Alzheimer's disease is that the swallowing reflex is lost. When people aspirate food, they develop pneumonia. Uh, and this is just a, a symptom of where the neurodegeneration has reached in, in your brain. Uh, you're now reaching state, uh, parts of the brain that are responsible for the basic things like swallowing, recent basic reflexes. The pathological hallmarks. Yes? Where does uh, short-term memory fall into mild cognitive Where does short-term memory, short like when do you first start to notice it? Yeah. You start to notice it in mild. And, and they become, memory then becomes a great, bigger and bigger problem as we progress. Okay. And is there a difference, or is it the same, um, in early onset versus when you're... Uh, For yeah, late onset, late yeah, onset. right. Yeah. So <laughs> the, um, the, the basic uh, course of the disease is not that different between early onset and late onset or sporadic. Uh, the main <coughs> thing that dif differentiates the two is that uh, people with early onset Alzheimer's disease, and somewhat, somewhat of an arbitrary definition, by the way, because it's just people who develop Alzheimer's disease before age 65. <coughs> for some of those people, not all of them, but for some of those people, there's a genetic reason for that. And the genetic reason uh, is linked to the uh, to abnormalities in uh, two things that we're actually going to talk about right now, and those things actually are linked to the pathological hallmarks of the disease, and led the the uh, science astray somewhat because people thought because these genes were becoming abnormally expressed in people with early onset, that, uh, that if you just stop that process, stop the abnormal production of those genes, then you cure the disease. And so let's just move on, and, and, and you'll see if, we'll see if you have that question answered. So the two pathological hallmarks are amyloid plaques and neural fibrillary tangles, okay? Amyloid plaques can be seen here, and they're formed by uh, aggregates of the amyloid beta protein that form around nerve cells. And these are, in fact, the, the, the characteristic uh, plaques that were seen when the disease was first described and identified. And they occur when a protein, the amyloid precursor molecule in cells, is cleaved by two, two specific uh, enzymes and it forms this protein called beta amyloid at a higher level than other forms of amyloid. And that beta amyloid ha is, is quote unquote sticky, has a tendency to aggregate and these plaques form around neurons and they become greater and greater in number. And for a long time, it was thought that the plaque was the enemy. If we just get rid of those plaques, then we're going to be able to cure people. As it turns out, that hasn't been so easy. You can, in fact, get rid of plaques. There uh, have been uh, basic science trials in laboratory animals, and there have been trials in humans that have very successfully eliminated plaques. And the people who don't recover or recover their, their function as people thought that they would. Uh, there's sort of been there's a bit of a joke, somewhat tongue-in-cheek, that we've cured Alzheimer's disease in animals hundreds of times. You know, you have many, many therapies have been developed that can clear plaques from animals, and then the same approach is used in humans. You can clear plaques from humans. A lot of the trials have had some pretty severe side effects, but even those that don't have devastating side effects have still uh, not produced the types of results that, that you would think. So 
amyloid is probably involved, but it's not the key or only uh, uh, element in this whole process that is going to make or break an individual's ability to, to recover from this disease. The other thing that's a pathological hallmark are these neurofibrillary tangles. There's a protein in our nerve cells called tau. It's actually, a fit, its official name is the microtubule associated protein tau. Microtubules are like railroad tracks in the, in the brain cell that, that allow proteins to attach to the track and travel from the cell body down to the terminal of the nerve cell and from the ter terminal of the nerve cell back up to the cell body. <clears throat> Those tracks, these tubules, do a great job when they're intact. And one of the things that helps to keep them intact is this protein called tau. And you can see these little tau molecules here. They're, they're these little uh, tiny strands that help, help to keep all these tubulin proteins uh, positioned properly relative to each other. And what happens in Alzheimer's disease and some other diseases called tauopathies are that the, the tau molecules change. They tip, uh, it's not that important, but they become hyperphosphorylated. More phosphorus atoms are attached to them. And when that happens, the tau molecules dissociate. They pull away from the tubules, and that causes two things. One is the tau itself tends to clump. They form these tangles. The other thing is that the support they were giving to the tubules is lost, and the tubules, these railroad tracks that are helping to send things down to the terminal and bring things back to the cell body, they fall apart. So, <clears throat> um, these these tangles are one thing that it was thought to be uh, important. Okay, well, these tangles, they, they must somehow be damaging the nerve cell. And then you combine that with the fact that the tubulin and the, and the microtubules are no longer working properly. Ah, well, that must be the secret. Okay, so if it's not the amyloid, then it must be the tau. And, well, unfortunately, uh, as you may have heard, uh, the, the tau, tau therapies haven't been especially successful either. They're more uh, recent in design and, uh, and use, but uh, they're not providing the sole answer either. So for decades, science focused on these two pathological problems, the, the amyloid uh, deposits uh, forming plaques and the, the neurofibrillary tangles and, and nerve cells, and figured and thought if we could just get rid of these two problems, or at least one or the other, we'll solve the problem of Alzheimer's disease. And what we've learned is that it's just simply not that simple. This is a much more complex disease. At the same time that we've had many frustrations with uh, developing therapies for Alzheimer's disease, We've also been learning quite a bit about what does contribute to it. And so I'd like to step over to risk. Um, before that, I did want to illustrate one thing. I, I've been talking to you about uh, these pathological hallmarks. There's one other thing that happens in Alzheimer's disease that is really, no matter what the cause, the culprit. So if we were to uh, take a look through a section of the brain this way, and a normal individual, and then look at it from a no brain from a normal individual, you would see that the cerebral cortex has these hills and valleys. And the hills and valleys are tightly pressed and they uh, they have very few gaps between the between the hills. This is the cerebral cortex where our cognitive abilities are, are housed. There's also a part of the cerebral cortex <clears throat> down here, the entorhinal cortex, that leads into an area called the hippocampus. The hippocampus is a part of the brain that's critical to the formation of new memories. So you have uh, uh, portions of the cerebral cortex that are serving 
language, information processing, executive function, and another part of the brain down here, the hippocampus, that's critical to the formation of new memories. What happens in Alzheimer's disease, and any neurodegenerative disease, is you start to lure, lose nerve cells. It's neurodegeneration. And so when that happens, you have shrinkage of the cerebral cortex. You, have, you lose the mass of the brain itself, the ventricles become large, and you have extreme shrinkage of this area called the hippocampus. So this neurodegeneration causes the cortex to shrink. As different parts of the cortex shrink, those cells die. That's when you lose these abilities to think, to plan, to make decisions. When the hippocampus shrinks, you lose cells there. That's when you lose your ability to form new, new memories. The dementia, and this is getting back to the question of like short-term memory and how, how does that uh, figure in. The dementia becomes more severe as the neurodegeneration becomes more widespread. So as you lose cells in the portions of the cerebral cortex, that are important in maintaining circuits relative to executive functioning, or cells that are in the hippocampus that are important in maintaining circuits that are helping you to remember things. As you lose those cells, you lose the circuits, and you lose the circuits, that's when you lose that ability that was associated with that part of the brain. And as the neurodegeneration spreads to different areas of the brain, people start to exhibit symptoms that are associated with the part of the brain that's now becoming affected. It doesn't happen everywhere at once. It tends to spread. And then as it gets deeper into regions in the brain stem, that's when you start to lose functions like the ability to swallow. No, it's not a, a pretty sight. So, <coughs> Just to give you some context for all this, how common is this disease? So people uh, and groups such as this often have um, personal experience, and it's often the thing that, that, that has caused you to, to come to try to learn more. But uh, it's also perhaps surprising to, to the people that are here and to people that, that, ha that haven't yet had a personal experience, is how common is Alzheimer's disease? In our state, where we have slightly less than a million people, in 2018, it was estimated by the Alzheimer's Association that about 23,000 Rhode Islanders had been diagnosed with uh, Alzheimer's disease. It was the fifth leading cause of death in Rhode Island in 2018. It actually may be higher. Uh, <coughs> physicians um, often underreport Alzheimer's disease as a cause of death. It's been estimated by a group uh, in Chicago that if the disease was more accurately reported as contributing to or causing de uh, death, it would be about the third cause of death in this state and uh, throughout the country. <coughs> the cost in dollars is enormous. The Medicaid cost for caring for people with, in Rhode Island with Alzheimer's was $438 million in 2018, expected to increase by 20, almost 27% over the next seven years as our population ages. And we'll talk a little bit about that. Mm -hmm. We've got 23,000 people with uh, Alzheimer's disease. There are roughly almost twice as many people that are caregivers providing care for those people. An estimated 61 billion hours of unpaid care, caring for those people. No disease modifying therapies are available. There are drugs that are available that can reduce the severity of the symptoms for some of the people uh, taking them. And some people find them Roughly one-third of the people that try them find them helpful for a period of time. It slows the decline, for it doesn't change the course of the disease, but it tends to slow the progression of the symptoms or diminish the symptoms for a period of time. 
So the risk. We mentioned uh, early onset and late onset. Most, 90, greater than 95%, are 65 and older and have late onset. And it's also known as sporadic. Uh, the, Explanation of the difference between early onset and late onset and its linkage to, to the genes uh, may be something that we can talk about in questions and answer session. It's a bit complicated uh, and it might be um, confusing. So if you have some questions about that, let me come back to it later and we can probe it if, if that's something that's of interest to, to the group. For now, I'm going to focus on the, the late onset, the sporadic. The main risk factors for late onset Alzheimer's, older age, as you get older, your risk of Alzheimer's disease, sporadic Alzheimer's disease increases. Having a family history of Alzheimer's disease increases your risk, like me. <coughs> Carrying the ApoE4 allele. You may have questions about ApoE. Uh, all of us carry two copies of this gene. Uh, Apolipoprotein E uh, is, the, is the protein. It's important in cholesterol trafficking and in helping to maintain membranes of cells, including neurons. Its precise contribution to Alzheimer's <coughs> disease is not well understood. There's still some questions about that. What we do know is that for most people who have the ApoE3, they carry two copies of the E3 allele. So you inherit one from your father, one from your mother. It could be a 2, a 3, or a 4. And you can get a 3 and a 4, 2 and a 4, 3 and a 3, 2 and a 2. If you have um, the ApoE2 allele, it actually seems to be a little protective, have a bit of a protective function. Again, not completely well understood. If you have the ApoE, two copies of the ApoE3, your risk of getting Alzheimer's disease relative to the E2 group is about three or four per, uh, times higher. Uh, and most of us are kind of in, in that group. If you have two copies of the E4, then your risk ri rises relative to the E2 of about 10 to 12 times higher. It sounds really bad, but it's just risk. Okay? As we're going to talk about later, it's about the same level of risk as having diabetes. Okay? So it's, it's definitely not telling you that you're going to get the disease. It's just telling you that <coughs> Uh, you are increasing your risk just as you increase your risk as you age or, or as you have an increased risk if a member of your, your immediate family has Alzheimer's disease. <clears throat> These are known as non-modifiable risk factors. You can't do anything about your family history or the fact that you're going to get older. Hopefully we will all continue to get older. It beats the alternative, as they say. And you can't do anything about what forms of the ApoE gene you carry. Yes? With respect to age as a risk factor, for 80, 85, 90, are you out of the woods? What are the statistics as you get older? So, the, uh, the likelihood that you will develop a dementia, including Alzheimer's disease, continues to increase as you age. But the slope changes. So it gets, there's an increased risk from like 65 to 80 that's, I'm just going to make up a slope, okay? It kind of goes up like that. But then it starts to taper off a bit as you get, so when you're, if you're 90 to 85, 90 years, say 90, if you're 90 years old and you have no symptoms of Alzheimer's disease, the chances that you're going to get Alzheimer's disease are pretty small. 
<clears throat> now, what tends to happen, and what we're seeing, is that uh, it's not that common that people just have one form, uh, one thing contributing to dementia. So we, uh, Alzheimer's disease is characterized by these uh, pathological hallmarks of plaques or tangles. But in fact, people who have Alzheimer's disease often have other things as well. You may have uh, 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 had uh, problems associated with neuronal death linked to uh, poor circulation in the brain. And you may have, there may be vascular factors contributing. There may be uh, inflammatory thing contributors to, to cell death. So th there are many things that are entering, that, that can cause dementia as you get older. And as we get older, the importance of the, they start to add up. You know, as we get older, we get more epigenetic changes because we're just exposed to environmental things that can cause us to have problems with gene expression. Uh, we have more, we've been uh, uh, hit with more <coughs> inflammation as we get older. We're more like, our blood vessels are becoming stiffer. Uh, we're more likely to have uh, vascular problems in the brain and, and elsewhere. So <clears throat> there, it becomes a bit complicated as we get older. You can still have dementia, and it may not be actually even be Alzheimer's disease. Say that again, please. You can still, as you get older, you can have, uh, you can develop dementia, and it may not be, strictly speaking, Alzheimer's disease. Alzheimer's is the most common form of dementia. It's not the only thing, and it's... Uh, presentation, it, as we're learning, is more complex than just this presence of amyloid and tau. There, there are other things that are that are contributing to cell death, and those things uh, become uh, uh, more noticeable as we age, like the stiffening of blood vessels, the inflammatory factors. Uh, so, uh, the, as you get toward this plateau stage. Uh, you may ha now be at a, at a point in time where you can pretty much say, well, the odds are that I'm just not going to get Alzheimer's disease. But it doesn't mean you should stop paying attention to things like uh, your diabetes control or uh, st remaining physically active, cardiovascular health. And we're going to talk a little bit about that. So we talked a bit about the non-modifiable risk factors. Are there modifiable risk factors? And can we address these to reduce our risk? And yes, we can. <clears throat> a recent report published by the Lancet Commission estimated that modifiable risk factors account for approximately one-third of the risk of developing dementia. So I was touching on this a moment ago. So there are some things that are happening as we get older that uh, we can impact or not pay attention to and, adju and adjusts your risk up or down as you're aging. It has been very challenging to examine the evidence and determine how significant different, non uh, different modifiable risk factors are in contributing to the disease. Uh, in part because this type of study is very hard to control. So say you're doing a study and you want to find out uh, whether a certain diet is beneficial for people who may be at risk of Alzheimer's disease. People are awful at being accurate reporting things like diet or exercise or you name it. But often we give answers that we think, yeah, we lie. <laughs> People, we give answers that we think the person doing the study wants to hear. And we, how many times have you gone to your doctor and you filled out those little forms before you, you're seen and you're reporting how much exercise you've had or how many glasses of wine you have a week or this or that, you name it. And we all tend to adjust the theoretically bad things down and theoretically good things up. Well, you know, yeah, four times a week for exercise. 
That was maybe three years ago for one week when you were really inspired. <laughs> but in any case, these are tough studies to conduct. So it has taken a long time for uh, people to do analyses of the studies and to give us a good picture of what the relative contribution might be. And it's still not uh, completely set in stone, but there are now very clear indications as to what might be very important and what still might be important, but the, the evidence isn't all in yet. So in this particular study that was done in 2015, so it's a number of years ago, but it's one of the best at trying to compare the different risk factors. And in this study, they looked at 60,000 clinical trials that had been conducted, randomized controlled trials. And they found that for things, as far as what increases one's risk in this category of uh, modifiable risk factors, actually the thing that had the strongest evidence was traumatic brain injury at that point in time. When you say traumatic, is that where you're not functioning properly anymore? Like, I, I had over 120 fights in my boxing career. And I know I had many concussions, and I still... Does that mean that's traumatic brain injury? <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, so um, as, uh, as we're, we, we continue to learn more about this, um, even one bad incidence of traumatic brain injury increases your risk of, the, of neurodegeneration, including Alzheimer's, really, uh, neurodegeneration down the road. Yes? But in what you're just talking about, presumably at age 60, it's one thing. At age 70 and 80, if it hasn't impacted at the earlier ages, is there any reason why it would impact at 80? Yes. Uh, it's not something that, uh, that it's not like on, at, at, on day uh, 13 of your uh, 67th year, all of a sudden, nerve cells start to die. Okay, it's it's a progressive phenomenon. We don't know exactly what it is that happens in uh, like CTE. You, know, you have these traumatic injuries of uh, fighters, football players, hockey players. <coughs> Multiple blows to to the head cause nerve damage. They cause the loss of neurons. Why? There are probably many things that are happening. Uh, just the insult itself may be, may, it, sometimes it's strong enough to actually sever connections. Uh, but, it, but there's also an inflammation that is established. And that inflammatory process uh, interacts with our immune system in some way that's not really well understood. But that inflammation certainly is a key component. And then there are things probably that contribute to the inflammation or maintain it. Some people may have uh, be at reduced risk because for some reason their cerebral vasculature is more resistant to damage. And so they're, they're, they come out a little bit better off. Some people, uh, there may be some other factor that we don't understand well that uh, is contributing to their increased likelihood. <coughs> certainly blows to the head. That's one thing we know, absolutely increases one's risk for, for Alzheimer's disease and other types of neurodegeneration. Yes? Um, I'm not sure I can really explain this, but it's a blood-brain barrier, correct? And yeah. it protects your brain from certain toxic chemicals. And when they produce medication that they want to get into the brain, they use chemicals like surfactants to transmit, to allow these things to go through the blood brain. Mm -hmm. And it troubles me that these same surfactants that go through the blood brain barrier are put in our foods, they put in our lotions, we use it on our face, we use it in all kinds of areas. And is this really wise? I mean, is it possible that these could also deter the blood brain barrier? And why do we do this? Uh, why don't we I, can, I can't tell you them? whether I don't know the evidence for the contribution of surfactants to uh, neurodegenerative disease. Uh, that, like many other things, 
one can rather easily develop an argument that makes sense. Uh, there are certainly things in our environment, such as lead, uh, other environmental toxins, that almost certainly increase our risk. The, 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 the actual metabolic pathway that might be impacted is probably a bit different for different things, but uh, it, it is wise to pay attention to what you're exposed to. Uh, as we learn more and more, we're learning that these things probably play a bigger role in uh, our lives than, than you might expect. I'm going to give you some a statistic, okay, <clears throat> somewhat of a statistic. So, <laughs> so um, our Western societies have, and uh, developed countries in general, have done quite a bit to reduce environmental toxins. And we take great pains to reduce lead. We've uh, done a lot about many other airborne pollutants. Uh, we're actually doing a much better job of reducing everyone's exposure to environmental toxins. So, one might wonder, has, had, has that had any impact on uh, the incidence of Alzheimer's disease, do you think? What's, what's your guess? No. no. It has. Yeah. Yeah. <coughs> the, pre the prevalence of Alzheimer's disease continues to increase. It's because our population continues to age. There are more of us 65 and above. 15 years from now, there are going to be way more of us, 65 and above. But if you look at Europe and North America, the incidence adjusted for age is decreasing for Alzheimer's disease. And it's almost certainly related to our society's uh, role in reducing the uh, exposure to some of these chemicals uh, that uh, had been very prevalent in, in our environment. So there, it's a bit of encouraging news uh, that um, not only supports the idea that modifiable risk factors are, are real and that there's important things you can do, but, but continuing to pay attention to these things continues to be important because who knows how much impact we can actually have. Yes? But isn't that a disease of the African countries? And if you go to four countries, you find much less Alzheimer's? Part of that is due to the fact that the people don't age, don't reach our age. Now, it, Alzheimer's disease and other neurodegenerative diseases didn't just spring up out, out of nowhere, but they're more common in our society than they were. Uh, but our population is also older than it ever was. People died of other things. You died of heart disease. You died of uh, stroke-related complications. You died of cancer. We can now fix many of those things, or at least add years to your life. Who knows how many people who died at 75 would have progressed from having some memory issues to some serious issues when they were 85. Yes. Um, the formal education and, and physical activity, is that a lifelong thing? Or if you got your doctorate at, at, at 30 and didn't do anything ever, and then you were like a marathon runner in your youth and you didn't do anything else, it's a, is it a lifelong thing? Yeah. Or is it... So, is, is uh, it, so, yeah, let's go through it. Let's go through this a little bit. So um, the things that for which there was... At this particular time, moderate evidence uh, increased your risk. Midlife obesity, midlife hypertension, smoking, diabetes. There was um, less clear evidence for a history of depression, sleep disturbances, and high cholesterol. <clears throat> Years of formal education, the evidence was strongest for that particular modifiable risk factor. It doesn't mean it's the most important modifiable risk factor. It just means that in this, when this study was done, it was the thing that, for which the evidence was most clear-cut. So they could say, okay, the, the, the evidence is strong. Um, 
and that's probably something I should, should emphasize. Just because traumatic brain injury uh, was dis determined to have uh, strong evidence, it doesn't mean that it was the strongest modifiable risk factor, it just, or the most important. It just meant that it was probably the easiest thing to study. And you had people that had traumatic brain injury of varying sever severities versus those that, that, that likely hadn't. And so it was a bit easier to study. Same thing with years of formal education. It's relatively easy for a scientist to determine how many years of formal education you've had and then to try to limit, eliminate other variables versus things that, where we, that we lie about, like <laughs> diet. <laughs> um, uh, so, but at, to answer your question, the education thing is interesting. Um, it's, the evidence is best for education prior to age roughly 20. Um, now, does that mean that after that point in time, education has no impact? No. It just means the evidence is best. So it was easiest to, to see a statistically significant result when you make this cutoff at a roughly college. There's clear evidence that for people that people who have a college education have a slightly <coughs> reduced risk of dementia relative to those who never went to college. And those that had uh, pursued postgraduate studies have a reduced risk uh, relative to those that went to college but uh, didn't go further. <coughs> As um, this question has continued to, to be studied, there's now evidence that it doesn't just stop. It, <coughs> it's um, it's just very difficult to measure how much cognitive stimulation a person is getting outside of formal education as we get older. But there seems to be almost certain evidence that if you are in a job or if you have a, a lifestyle that causes you to be constantly challenged, then that reduces your risk. And there's going to be one thing I'm going to talk about in a second before we finish up that will address that. Say the thing you just said uh, a little differently. It's not, it's not clear to me what you sure. just said. Sure. So, um, it's, we know that uh, more years of formal education provide some benefit in reducing your risk of developing Alzheimer's disease. <clears throat> And for a long time, it wasn't certain whether stimulating your brain, challenging your brain after age 20, 25, if it had any benefit. By more education. By more education or just doing things that are challenging. And, it, and the problem has been, as far as science goes, it's hard to study the amount of stimulation you're getting in your life relative to this person's life or that person's life outside of something that's easier to measure, like how many years you went to college or went to school. And so it had been kind of a fuzzy area. It's like logic suggested there must be some benefit, but what was the benefit and how, how do we measure it? People have started to come up with ways of doing that. And so as they've continued to probe it, the evidence is that yes, these things that we do to challenge ourselves are beneficial and reducing our risk. Why? It may be that what you're doing is contributing to this idea called uh, cognitive reserve, which is sort of a catch-all term for something that's not very well understood. It just means that for some reason <coughs> this person <coughs> seemed to be more resilient to the, uh, to the things that contribute to dementia than that person, and it's linked somehow to the fact that they had more education or they had more, more stimulation of their brain as they were going through life. The idea is that it's probably linked to the fact that stimulating the brain, especially when you're younger, increases the number of contacts that nerve cells make with each other and strengthens networks related to memory and other types of, of uh, cognition. Uh, it may be more brain cells survive because we lose uh, some brain cells as we get older. 
There's a debate as to whether or not we generate new ones. Uh, each year there's another big paper that comes out that contradicts the one of the year before. So it's kind of hard to know. But uh, in mice, uh, every, uh, in uh, non-human primates and, and most other mammals, yeah, absolutely br more brain cells get produced throughout life. In humans, the data is a bit fuzzy. <laughs> that said, um, brain cells uh, maintain connections if there's enough activity in the network. <laughs> if the activity is not maintained, then the connections get weaker and weaker, and they can be lost. This is a big factor in how we develop circuits when we're a fet fetus in, in early life. So it's thought that uh, by constantly challenging the brain, first with formal education, then later with other forms of mental stimulation, you help to maintain the activity in these circuits, and they stay strong for a longer period of time. So maybe, according to this theory, if you were a person that was destined to develop Alzheimer's disease, and maybe in the absence of this formal education, you would have developed it at age 70, let's say. Perhaps by pursuing more education when you were younger and pursuing more things to stimulate and engage your brain as you were going through your life, you may have developed this cognitive reserve that helped to delay the onset of the disease by maybe five years or 10 years. So it's a reserve, maybe it's more brain cells, maybe it's more connections between brain cells. We don't really know. Uh, there are a lot of laboratory animal studies that suggest it's both of those things. In humans, it's not quite as certain. Yes? There's, there's no mention of drinking. <laughs> no, no, I think that's a... He said that there, you didn't mention drinking. <laughs> so, uh, moderate alcohol consumption. Well, There is evidence that uh, for men, two, two uh, equivalent of two glasses of wine uh, per day, and for women, the equivalent of one glass of wine per day, <coughs> is somewhat protective. It diminishes your risk. Uh, there is some controversy about that, because um, as your risk of heart disease and dementia decreases, your, your risk of certain types of cancer seems to increase, especially oral, esophageal, gastric cancer increases. So, um, it, again, this is Excuse me, another one where it seems like every year there's another study that comes out that contradicts the one, the big one of the year before, where one, one year we're, we're, we're being told, uh, oh, definitely have those two glasses of wine per day, guys, and ladies, please have your one glass of wine per day. And the next year they're going to say, oh, you know, the risk of cancer is actually offsets that, so you probably shouldn't. Uh, I, I won't give you any more advice than that. <laughs> Yes. How risky is the use of uh, benzodiazepines? Um, benzodiazepines, uh, the risk, like Val Valium, Xanax, uh, the, <clears throat> there have been some studies that have indicated that there's, um, that they may actually increase one's risk. But uh, there have also been those that have suggested that it's somewhat of an artifact, and it might actually be that one performs uh, poorer on certain cog in cognitive measures when you're taking the drug of that type. So I don't know that it's, a, from what I have seen, the, the uh, it, there's no consensus at the, at the present time. I have about four more quick slides if you want to hang in there for it. So, that was a study that was done in 2015. So have we learned anything since? Yeah, there have been continued, more studies have come out more recently to support some of these concepts that were suggested as possibly important. For one, obesity. Uh, and this, this study, it was uh, a big study of uh, over a million people in the United States and Europe and, and Asia. Higher body mass index and midlife was associated with increased dementia and later life. Um, there have actually been a number of studies that have shown that midlife is an especially important time uh, for both physical activity and obesity and other things. 
uh, including diabetes, high blood pressure. For some reason, it seems especially important that people start to address these things in midlife and not wait until uh, later life before they start to pay attention. Uh, it's probably related to the fact that this is a, is a progressive disease. These effects are cumulative over decades. This, just looking at amyloid, we now know that amyloid in people that develop Alzheimer's disease, amyloid starts to build up decades before there are any clinical uh, symptoms. Uh, and so there, there's certainly uh, a lot that's happening in our 30s and 40s that impacts whether or not we're going to get dementia. That doesn't settle it, but impacts whether we'll get dementia later. Cardiovascular health. Here's another one that looked at it in midlife. And cardiovascular fitness in midlife is associated with better cognitive function, not just then, but a reduced risk of cognitive decline 20 years or later. And for until somewhat recently, uh, there was less clear evidence for what we might be able to do when we're older and whether there's any benefit to doing things when we're older and to reduce our risk. The good news is yes. It's just that it took a little bit longer to, to prove it. Partly because this is another case where it's very hard to do the study. So in other words, uh, it's really hard to study people who are in the uh, uh, in, in their seven, late 70s, 80s, and to get them to do vigorous physical activity, it's hard to even uh, to agree on a definition of what vigorous vig physical activity <laughs> is in all these studies, but especially for the, the as people uh, you know, progress in age, because um, the physiologists do have ways of, of studying your oxygen consumption, for example, and clearly, what uh, gets your oxygen consumption to a certain level in your 40s, that level of activity is going to be much greater than what's going to uh, stress you as much when you're in your 80s. The problem is, does that decreased level of activity in, in the people in their 80s still have benefit? And that's what was really hard. In other words, you're still challenging your cardiovascular system, but there's, is there benefit? And it took longer be able to show that yes, it does. Uh, there's still a lot of disagreement as to what exactly is the best type of physical activity, uh, whether it's aerobic or anaerobic resistance, uh, or just or how intense it has to be. Um, again, it's an issue. It's easiest to prove if it's really physical, act, vigorous physical activity, because the results are most <coughs> clear cut. But there's almost certainly, it's almost certainly true that even just regular walking has a protect, a, 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 uh, the effect of decreasing your risk. And diet is a, is a big one. Uh, it's, there's now good evidence that uh, d diets like the Mediterranean diet and the DASH diet, which is a hypertension diet, um, that these, these diets that are, that are uh, high in olive oil, uh, 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 multicolored vegetables, fruits, nuts, uh, typically reduced meat, increased fish intake, uh, they do reduce one's risk. And for a long time, it wasn't clear uh, whether or not this is also something that had to be done in middle life. Uh, but now, uh, this, this and other papers are showing that uh, you can start, you can <coughs> impact your risk, even in later life. The mean age in this study was 71. And so you can reduce, you continue to impact your risk, even in later life. And uh, this last one that I want to show is, uh, diabetes is, is a, uh, a disease that is uh, clearly related to increased risk. Uh, probably for a couple of different reasons. Uh, one of which is the impact that diabetes has on your cardiovascular system. Yes. Are you talking about type one and type two? Yes. Oh. Uh, yeah. Would yeah. That, please? Uh, it's it's type one and type two. Uh, uh, both seem to be increased associated with an increased risk. 
Um, and in, in both cases, the thing that's most important is controlling the diabetes. Uh, it's the same thing like uh, hypertension. Um, just having hypertension or being diagnosed with it uh, is, is not necessarily a clear indication that you're going to be at increased risk. Because if you control it throughout your lifetime with medication, now we have that available, um, then it seems to adjust the risk back down again. So it's a modifiable risk factor. It's not something that's set in, in stone. Um, depression and sleep are two others that, for which there's a, a now better evidence. Um, having depression, probably not um, of concern. Having untreated depression, almost certainly is a concern. Uh, sleep is another thing. Uh, having sleep difficulties um, seems to be uh, increase one's risk. How to get around that with treatment? Uh, treatments for sleep disorders are trickier. So that the evidence for treatment and the impact of the treatment is less clear right now. Yes. I, I do have the seat back. You know, to, to talk later. I mm -hmm. love it. It just changed my life. I mean, I just. Um, so you're using CPAP and it's and it's almost it certainly me. decreasing I mean, I your risk. I was fuzzy. I was all like almost falling asleep at the wheel, and now I'm I'm clear today. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, you're helping your 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 cerebral vasculature when you do that. So you're, you're helping. Yes. Okay. Um, my last data slide is this one here because it's often a question people ask. What about computer computerized? Um, cognitive skill uh, uh, use, and, and is there any benefit to that? This particular study was done in 2017. They looked at a whole bunch of different types of uh, uh, brain exercise, both games, video games, uh, different computer uh, skills, things. They found that the evidence uh, was supportive of a benefit for just one type. It's called speed of processing training. So. What they found is that people who do things like memorize lists and see if they can repeat them later and get see how long they can get their list to be, etc. <clears throat> well, maybe it's helpful, but what they think is you just get really good at memorizing long lists. <laughs> uh, what seems to be most beneficial is if people do things that challenge uh, the brain even more. And one type that was shown to be beneficial is the speed of processing training. There was a, there's a type of computer training, uh, computer exercise uh, uh, program out there that <coughs> challenges you to do things faster. So it's the speed of processing information, not memorizing a long list, but it, for, for example, uh, in adding or multiplying, to do that faster. You know, add two numbers faster, multiply two numbers faster. It's probably, well, it's not known, but it's probably due to the fact that that's especially challenging. It's really hard to do that, to increase the speed at which you can multiply numbers, or speed at which you can subtract numbers from, from the previous number, like going from 100 down. That's really hard. And so it's probably very challenging and challenges the circuits and so it's just that it, the scientists were able to demonstrate it in fact because it's the hardest thing that they were able to cook up for people to do. So is something like a video game or, or uh, any other kind of uh, brain game, is there a benefit? It's, there, there isn't clear evidence that it is. Maybe some of them are. But there is evidence that uh, there's hope that this approach, uh, especially if it's very challenging to the brain, might have benefit. Yes? So are there computer programs that you know of that teach you to do that? That was a proprietary program that that group developed. Um, and they have commercialized it, but I don't know the name. So Chris, yes? Chris, a little louder. The Alzheimer's uh, Association over in the UK has put out a free access um, game, computer-like game. It's called Sea Hero, S-E-A-H-E-R-O. And so it builds up the processing speeds. You, you have a couple of elements. You've got color, you've got motion, and we have it, and it's by <coughs> and it changes. This kind of changes over time. So it's continually 
play it? No. <laughs> Good. It's, it's, it's a loop, but you have to navigate different obstacles. Can you hear? Like the ice bird and the so my last slide just summarizes some of the more recent evidence uh, that I've just been talking about in the last few slides. Uh, and I think the bottom line is that most everything outside of the things like um, potential contribution of depression and, and, uh, and sleep and the possible benefit of the, uh, the type of brain training that involves speed of processing, most everything that seems to be important in diminishing one's risk is for Alzheimer's disease is also important in diminishing your risk for cardiovascular mm -hmm. disease. That's the big take-home message. Uh, the, the blood vessels <coughs> that are in our body that, that are subject to the insults associated with cardiovascular disease, uh, the same blood vessels are in our brain. The brain utilizes more oxygen, has a higher metabolic demand than any other organ in, in the body. And if you ever looked at a, a blood cast of, of the brain, it's it just packed with blood vessels. And so maintaining the health of those blood vessels is, is critically important. And probably the most important thing relative to protecting oneself uh, to, for developing a, a dementia. Yes, yeah, so in the back, Tim. Could you talk a little bit about what's going on in URI and the Ryan Institute? So, the, the Ryan Institute has um, a, a core group of faculty that are studying who, whose research interests focus on the cerebral vasculature and inflammation. And they use a number of different approaches to study um, the contribution of the cerebral vascular inflammation uh, and looking at it in animal models and, and laboratory studies, uh, we had hoped that we'd be uh, ha uh, announcing a clinical trial related to a drug that uh, addresses inflammation uh, concerned with the cerebral vasculature. So it turns out this is a hard thing to do at a university that doesn't have a medical so you or I have never had a drug trial before. And uh, the process for, for trying to make it work at URI turned out to be challenging. And um, our executive director, Paula Gramis, um, unfortunately lost her funding for the trial because of the time that it took for, for this to happen, primarily. Uh, so she's still hoping, and Chris is, is working with her in the back of the room, to perhaps uh, be able to uh, still conduct the trial at another location. Uh, that would uh, involve a better infrastructure. Uh, but it's, I think, the uh, harbinger of the future in that the most promising therapies will probably not have much, if anything, to do with the pathological hallmarks of amyloid and tau. They're going to be addressing pro things that happen earlier in life, the inflammation that happens earlier in life, the aberrations, the, the things that go wrong with the immune system earlier in life. Um, and uh, I think that we'll find that, in fact, inflammation, uh, particularly related to uh, cerebral vasculature inflammation, is the most important culprit. And, um, and things uh, like the familial uh, disease have been almost a just distraction because they are due to specific types of gene mutations, this early onset, the familial type of the early onset, that, that don't occur for most of us. And so it was a bit of uh, a red herring, I think. Uh, at, not completely, but, but uh, certainly a distraction that led pharma, big pharma, to go in a direction that um, probably uh, uh, was uh, misleading. Yes? Can you have a brain scan done? And if so, what should you do? So, the, so, so it used to be. Repeat the question. So, can you have a brain scan done? So, it used to be that the only way to diagnose Alzheimer's disease was at death. 
an autopsy, right? You had to prove that you had the, the plaques and the tangles and you couple that with the clinical presentation and you could make the diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease. Um, <clears throat> that uh, is, is not strictly just speaking necessary anymore because we now can do PET scans. Uh, there have been PET scans for amyloid available for quite some time. Uh, now PET scans for, for hyperphosphorylated tau are becoming available and moving out of the, the, the research realm into clinical use. Uh, it still presents the problem of what do you do with the information. And so that's something that I think you have to discuss carefully with, with your doctor. Uh, and um, I'll, I'll introduce this caveat. You can have a lot of amyloid in your brain and have never developed Alzheimer's disease. Okay. So you need to speak with the clinician that you're working with and decide, you know, why am I doing this? You know, what's, the, what's the reason? If you're part of a clinical trial, then they may want to have a means of establishing whether or not you're even a candidate for the clinical trial. And so there, you know, that, that may be for you the, the sufficient reason to, to do it. Same thing for um, testing whether you're APOE4 or APOE3. You, know, um, you, you may want to participate in a clinical trial, and that's one of the inclusion criteria, and they have a rationale for wanting to use that of one of the criteria. You may decide that's perfectly good reason for me to know. I, my caveat would be just pay attention to the fact that um, being APOE4 positive is not a death sentence. Uh, having amyloid is not a death sentence. Uh, you, um, it, they just impact risk. That's the thing to keep in mind. It's just stratifying risk, and so it's important to discuss with your clinician, why do I want to know this? What am I going to do that's different? Uh, maybe you have already an answer for that, but it's not something that I would presume to to speak too much about. Yes? We talked about <coughs> inflammation, and every week there's an article somewhere about these foods that help fight inflammation, other spices. Is there any, any evidence-based <coughs> research in that area about it's specific foods? Or? Not very good. Uh, is, is there evidence for specific foods fighting inflammation? Uh, the evidence isn't especially strong. Uh, the, uh, <coughs> that is the, 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 the clear scientific evidence. The circumstantial evidence is fairly strong that certainly the Mediterranean diet is beneficial. So why? It's probably because the uh, diet in some way does impact systemic, overall body inflammation. It is probably uh, decreasing the damage that inflammation causes. Inflammation itself, uh, it, it's, it's really the, the toxic proteins that are produced during the inflammatory process that are, are dangerous, that are damaging. And so you want to reduce the production and increase the clearance of those proteins. And some of these diets do seem to do that. Uh, it's the same as an anti-inflammatory drug does that. Um, as it turns out, anti-inflammatory, like non-steroidal anti-inflammatories, are not very useful when one has already developed Alzheimer's disease. But there is some evidence that taking anti-inflammatory drugs starting when you're younger may actually have some benefits. That's a that's a that's something that's that's still out there. You know that they're. Uh, you have to weigh that against the, the, the negative, potential negative consequences of the GI side effects. Yes, in the back, yeah. So, gut and brain health. So, the, um, the gut, see, we have a microbiome in our gut. And there's a lot of work being done right now on interactions between the, the microbiome in the gut and brain health. And uh, it's, a, it's complicated. It probably involves the, uh, the immune system and the interactions between the microbiome and the immune system 
and then the interaction between the immune system and the brain. Um, for one, at, for a long time, it, the dogma has brain, been that the brain is an immunoprivileged site and that uh, immune cells from the periphery don't get into the brain. And so it's almost like you've got you know, your apple and your orange and you have to study them. It turns out that that's probably not true. Uh, there is a group at, at, uh, at the Ryan Institute, in fact, that studies the uh, migration of peripheral immune cells uh, into the brain and has some very convincing evidence that those particular cells, in fact, contribute in a very big way to the inflammation that occurs around blood vessels in the brain as part of the pathogenesis of neurodegenerative disease. Yes? So how strong is the evidence that Alzheimer's disease skips a generation? Um, having, a, having a family history of Alzheimer's disease increases your risk. Can you say that Alzheimer's disease necessarily skips a generation for any reason? It's, you, you really can't. And the reason is that, for, uh, that there's no clear genetic cause to sporadic or late onset Alzheimer's disease. There are a number of different mutations that can increase your risk, but it's not like you can have Mendelian inheritance and you can either you either get like an, an E3 and an E4 or whatever. It, um, there's no gene, one gene, that serves that function for the vast majority of the people that get all. So it's probably a, a bit misleading to think that it does. And if, if you're noticing in your family that that's happening or in other families, it could, it's probably due to other things. Uh, who knows? Environmental exposures, location where you were brought. In fact, even the issue of for, for sporadic Alzheimer's disease, why is there a family history? It may be that families tend to cluster together. And so, if your parents were exposed to a certain environment, environmental toxins, and you were uh, raised in the same area, separating that out is really challenging. Yeah. And so, you know, it's, it's complicated, again, because there's no one gene for the vast majority of people that get Alzheimer's. There's no one gene causing it. There's no two genes. There's about 25 gene <coughs> mutations that are associated with increased risk, but not no one of those gene mutations causes the disease. There's probably a need for many of them to happen, and most of those genes are related to inflammation and immune system. And so they're probably, as a whole, increasing your susceptibility to inflammation or having something to do with your immune system that is making you more likely to get the disease. Yes? You mentioned the um, environmental impact, which I'm really concerned that our federal government right now is doing away with things that we put into place over the past 20, 30 years to keep our air and water clean. <coughs> is anyone telling our federal government that I, this is an issue? I, I, I'd love to think so, but I'm, I'm, a, I'm a bit pessimistic right now. <laughs> uh, but, but certainly, certainly it's... Uh, um, I, I'm very concerned myself that uh, some of the, the strides that we've made uh, to improve our environment and reduce our risk have, uh, are in danger of, um, that as, as a society, we're in danger of sliding back to a time when we have increased exposure to those toxins. And yeah, um, it's actually just very recent that the data regarding the de decreased incidence of Alzheimer's in um, developed countries is becoming uh, well known. So uh, I guess the right people have to be, but it, it's, uh, it's a big concern for me too because my research interest is epigenetics, so it's environmental exposure is a big part of that. Yes? Inflammation, okay. How would I know if I am experiencing inflammation? 
so how would you know if you're experiencing inflammation? Well, the, 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 cl the classic inflammation uh, classically is um, the, uh, the, the cerebral, the, the vasculature's response to, to a, uh, uh, an injury. So, for example, when you get that, that flare of red around a cut due to the, the body's uh, response to the uh, injury and the infectious agent that the immune system is fighting, that's inflammation. It's becoming inflamed. Okay? Now, as we've now learned about protein expression stuff, we now know that when that happens there and when uh, injuries occur elsewhere in the body, that the, 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 the thing to pay attention to is the release of, of, of proteins that are part of the body's response to that injury. And that response can occur in a good way, and it can occur in a way that's not especially good. And it depends on whether or it depends on many things. But uh, many times the immune system and the body's in, uh, inflammatory response are triggered by things that are not necessarily, uh, would not have no obvious negative uh, impact on the individual, but they're being interpreted as potentially injurious. And so the body mounts this, these multiple pathways that uh, are designed to help us, and ev in an evolutionary sense were helpful, but in this, in certain contexts, are, are not especially helpful. Yes. Um, what do you want to well, my question is just like, okay, so brain injury causes inflammation in the brain, but how about inflammation in the rest of the body? Is that going to affect the brain as well? It's not known, strictly speaking, but in so there are some types of inflammation that that don't seem to produce a systemic response and don't necessarily result in systemic, that is, throughout the whole body, circulation of proteins that are associated with inflammation, inflammatory, pro-inflammatory, inflammatory proteins. So a little cut on your leg produces inflammation. Does that produce a systemic response? If it gets bad enough, it, it might, but not necessarily. Uh, it becomes trickier in things like um, uh, rheumatoid arthritis, for example, where there is a systemic response, but it's not well understood whether or not that impacts the brain. Um, but the, the brain does have a blood-brain barrier. Not all proteins that circulate in the body can cross that blood-brain barrier. Some can, some can't. And so <clears throat> I'm not personally aware of any especially good evidence that links systemic inflammation to an increased risk of um, a neurodegenerative disease because of the difficulty in separating out whether or not that systemic inflammation involved something like the blood vessels in the brain also. So I think the jury's still out. Yes? Can you speak about the effect on the brain of uh, anesthesia uh, for surgery? Yeah, there, there is evidence that anesthesia, uh, especially um, multiple anesthesias, can increase your risk of, of dementia. Um, it's, it's not well understood why, why that might be. And, there have been some studies that have actually contradicted that. So, uh, personally, I would say the jury's still out on that one too. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it, it, I, I personally wouldn't change um, whether or not if I was going to have a colonoscopy, I'd still want to be fine. I'll take the risk. <laughs> yes. Um, and, and, and when I go things, try to look into the Alzheimer's, I find out that it seemed to have started in the 1970s. I mean, it was, it was originated in, in 1915, but it was at low rates. And something happened in 1970 where the whole thing just seemed to mushroom. And to me, that's got to be some kind of environmental toxin. Something in the environment is doing this. 
there, 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 yeah, was, like an, there was an yeah. uptick, and it actually starts a little bit early, like in the 50s to 60s. Uh, it's also at a time when people started to live longer. So it's when people started to live longer. Our eight, our, the, pop, the number, the percentage of the population that was reaching age 85 um, started to, to increase substantially. Uh, our, you know, our life, average life expectancy has crept up, but um, when you start to discount for things like uh, cancer and, um, and, and heart attacks and, and, and some other uh, things that we're now doing a much better job at handling, uh, the, the percentage of the population that's reaching their 80s and 90s steadily increases, and there's every indication it's going to continue to go up. But what would account for a spike? Uh, I, I would agree with you that outside of age, it could, it, my, my guess, guess would be that it's environmental exposure. Do you think it could have been just more diagnosis? I remember a great grandmother, this was in the early 40s, and she lived out of dementia. Nobody ever took her to a doctor. Uh, well, there, there, that's so I think better diagnosis. There, that's absolutely true. There, there certainly is a much better awareness. Uh, both, and in fact, it's still a struggle to educate primary care providers as to uh, it's getting much better. But for a long time, uh, specialists were frustrated at the uh, at the number of people that uh, were slipping through the cracks and not being diagnosed. It was just, you know, I, I, Winnie was always a little bit wacky, you know, kind of thing. So a lot of people um, almost certainly were not diagnosed. Um, before I forget, I did promise Chris that I would mention that uh, Annie Murphy from the Alzheimer's Association, who will be your next speaker, I think. Yes. yes. Um, she's left some uh, business cards uh, with us so if you have, Alzheimer's Association in Rhode Island uh, is a tremendous resource for getting uh, information about this disease. And they have a number of programs to help people, uh, caregiver support programs, as well as uh, programs to help you navigate this complicated landscape. And uh, Annie is really, really good. Uh, they don't have a lot of people there, but they manage to do a lot with few people that they have. And, um, and so they have a great website, by the way. You can go to their website and get quite a bit of information.